Hey there, it's Susan Pierce Thompson and welcome to the weekly vlog. So I thought I might catch your attention with this vlog title. I've been in relapse, parentheses, your holiday mindset guide. What do those two things even have in common? <laughs> um, everything, it turns out. Wait, 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 wait. Let me first back up and just say, last week on the weekly vlog, um, I did the first ever live weekly vlog and I took the call from Patty Gift, the editorial director of Hay House, and she told me that we, with our official Bright Line Eating cookbook, made the New York Times bestseller list. Um, it's at number seven on the list. And if you wanna see it there, now's the time to Google it because uh, I believe the New York Times changes its online list over the weekends. So all week this week, we are on the list. I doubt we'll make it for a second week. So um, yeah, now's the time to look and just thank you so much for everything that you, the collective you, the collective we, the collective us did to uh, make that happen. It was really something to, uh, to see that, right? It was really fun. Some people wrote in like, uh, I think we had 15 people write in saying, why are you talking about this so much? Like, why are you so, you know, like, ah, wh why do you care? Why are you so intent on this? This is unhealthy, blah, blah, blah. And I just wanted to own, like, I am ridiculously high in this thing called achievement orientation. It is a trait, like extroversion or like, you know, neuroticism or agreeableness or something. Achievement orientation is a thing. And I am one of these doofuses that will climb Mount Everest uh, preferentially because it's the tallest mountain in the world over whatever mountain it is that nobody's ever heard of that's the second tallest mountain in the world. I am one of those people and I will admit it. Um, but it's also a thing for the Bright Line Eating Movement to get recognized like that. Uh, it does matter for um, the very healing, life-saving message that we're trying to propagate. Um, for real, for real, it does matter. So um, anyway, that's the subject for another vlog. I just wanted to say thank you and um, to, to just say that the list is up weekend to weekend. So if you want to Google, you know, New York Times bestseller list. Also, the way the New York Times list works, I don't know if you know this, is it's organized by category. Every book in the whole world that's published is eligible for just one of the sub lists. There is no overall list like Amazon, like all books or whatever. There's no more prestigious list. So they have a nonfiction list, quote unquote nonfiction. That's not a list we're eligible for because it's only for history, memoir, and uh, politics. Um, the advice how to miscellaneous is for all um, cookbooks, instruction type books, self-help books, all that sort of stuff. So. Um, uh, my dad asked, uh, so since he was asking, I thought you might not know either. Um, uh, when you say number seven, does that mean out of all books? And the, the New York Times list doesn't work that way. It's separated out by category. Every category is equally prestigious. And um, we made the list, the one and only list in the area that we were eligible for. So anyway, uh, sort of like winning a bronze medal in the Olympics in your sport, right? Like, no, we didn't win in gymnastics, we won in bobsledding, whatever. Wrong season, you know what I mean. Um, okay, so let's get back to this week. You know, it's early November and um, I'm thinking about holidays. I'm guessing you're starting to think about holidays too. So I wanted to shoot a holiday survival guide for you, a holiday mindset guide, because this is the time of year that uh, uh, many a brain out there in Bright Line Eating Land starts to play the maybe we'll have an exception game, doesn't it? Just saying. I have one of those brains too, so if you have a brain that's saying, you know, huh, maybe we'll just relax things a little bit through the holidays and then tighten right back up January 1st, because January 1st, 2020 is going to be the perfect time to tighten back up. So let me just say, as I see it right now, I have been essentially in and out of relapse. I've been in relapse for the better part of four and a half years. Um, I left my 12-step program for food addiction in early 2015, like early spring 2015. 
And it was months. At that point, I had years of perfect back-to-back. I hadn't had any sugar, no flour, not a baby carrot off my plan. Perfect three meals, weighed and measured. Not a baby carrot off my plan for years. And I left that 12-step program and um, kept my food perfect, perfectly bright for months. And then in July of 2015, I overate a little bit at a baby shower, meaning I went back for more cheese and salami a few too many times. Um, And that was the first break in my bright lines in many a year. From then till now, I haven't gained back weight. I haven't, um, I don't know what, had to check myself in for eating disorder treatment like I did when I was 23. I haven't, um, you know, like nothing on the outside extraordinarily awful has happened. And I've kept my bright lines probably 90 to 95 percent, probably 95 percent of those days. I've had squeaky clean bright line days, 90 to 95 percent of the days, depending on the month. Um, I just recently had a stretch of five months and another stretch of five months. I've actually only been off my lines um, for two little blips out of the last year. I'm on day 50 something as of right now, as of this moment that I'm shooting this video. But I wanted to share with you something I've noticed. Because um, the thing about long-term data is it takes a long time to collect it, right? It's expensive to collect long-term data. Ask any longitudinal researcher uh, what's hardest about the work they do. And the answer is um, keeping people in the study long enough to keep asking them the questions year after year after year, paying for it. It's expensive and it's time consuming. It takes a long time. So I have been collecting longitudinal data on myself over the last four and a half years uh, since I first broke my bright lines in July of 2015. So not quite four and a half years. Um, And here's what I've found. The data are in and I have analyzed them. Although nothing horrible on the outside has happened, my children are all still well, bright line eating is still thriving, I'm still in a right size body, yada, yada, yada. If one were to chart my feelings of well-being and flourishing and uh, self-confidence and like self-efficacy, the feeling that I can do what needs to be done in the world, what you would find over the last four and a half years is that like the stock market, it goes up and down. Like most things, like a heartbeat, goes up and down. But unlike a heartbeat, which is steady, or the stock market, which over time goes up, my flourishing and well-being have been going down. Up and down and up and down with my breaks and my resumes. Break, resume, break, resume. But overall, down. And what has happened is I find myself here after four and a half years significantly lower in well-being than I was before after a stretch of years of squeaky clean bright lines. And here's what I attribute that to. Yes, I can break and resume. I have learned how to do that. But the effort it takes, the bandwidth it sucks up, the time for the eating and the binging and the whatever, the, the time it takes to snap out of the trance, the time it takes to launch the new plan of more support or whatever it is, how I'm gonna refigure and rejigger the whole thing. And then the time it takes to like go through the early days again, <clears throat> because, <clears throat> excuse me, being an earlier recovery like the first few days is a detox and a system shock and all that, right? <clears throat> excuse me. I could stop and re-record this, but it wouldn't help because I've got some of the crud, so, excuse me. So, it has continued to be a time suck, the breaking and the resuming. And what that does is it gobbles up just enough of the bandwidth that I used to use to improve my life. 
to read books, to um, work out, to hone and perfect my morning routine, to love on my kids and my husband, to do the things that make my life ever better. And because I have not had the bandwidth, that same amount of bandwidth overall to make my life ever better, what's been happening in the context of a very busy life is that my life has become ever less better. Up and down and up and down, but overall the trajectory has been down. My daughter Alexis asked an hour or two ago, I said I was going to shoot the vlog, and she said, what are you going to shoot it on? And I said, relapse, and she said, what's relapse? She's 11, 11 and a half as of a couple days ago. And I said, um, you know how mommy breaks her bright lines sometimes? She said, yeah. I said, that's relapse. I said, when an addict uses their drug again after a long period of abstinence, it's a relapse. If someone who quits smoking picks up a cigarette, it's a relapse. If an alcoholic who's been sober for a while picks up a drink, it's a relapse. And she said, oh. I don't think I've used the R word in this vlog before. I shot a vlog <clears throat> long time ago, back in probably 2015, called The Morning After a Binge. Got more comments and whatever than most of my vlogs at that point ever had. And I was stunned. I was like, oh my gosh, people don't um, want to run me out of town. I mean, I was basically coming from the 12-step background I, I, I have come from, where perfection is the only um, way to stay credible. Um, I was thinking that in most people's eyes, I would just lose the credibility to stand in front of here and say anything at all. Um, to the contrary, most people felt like, oh, finally someone is talking about my life. Like I am struggling with the food too, right? So um, here's the reason though why I'm gonna basically try to convince you not to go that route because the data are in and overall your life, goodness, whatever, your sense of flourishing goes down, yes. And I want you to think about it this way. As we approach the holidays, think about what's on this side of the equation and what's on this side of the equation. When you think about that voice of that saboteur that might be saying something like, oh, just a bite of that, you know, holiday treat or a little bit of this or just relax the rules a little bit or you deserve it or you'll tighten up at, you know, in January, whatever, right? Think about what you buy if you follow that path. You buy a little comfort, a little ease. Um, you grease the social skids a little bit. You don't need to say no to, you know, Aunt Judy when she says that she bakes this specially for you, you know, or whatever, right? Think about what's on this side of the equation. Your health, your happiness, your well-being, living in a right-sized body, getting off those medications, waking up in the morning without joint pain, depending on what kind of numbers you're coming from, getting to fly on airplanes without worrying about how much space you're taking up beside you, not having to use a seatbelt extender, uh, liking how you look, feeling good in your skin, um, being able to show up in the summer in a bathing suit, avoiding heart disease, um, greatly reduced risk for cancer, for diabetes, having energy to get through every day to do everything else that you most like in life and love in life. Basically, all, if, you, if you've been bright for any stretch of time, you're probably aware that on this side of the equation is all that's good with life, like all of your upwelling of gratitude and freedom and peace. And, and on this side of the equation is basically a cookie. And in what world does all of that get counterbalanced effectively by that.
Like, really? Isn't that insanity? Like, I know that's a strong word, but it's such a lack of proportion, right? Lack of ability to think straight, to think, huh, getting to eat however many more bites of food for, you know, this holiday season is worth trading in all of this stuff for. I'll stay on medications, I'll uh, hate myself, I'll be fat, I'll um, maybe not live to see my grandkids graduate from high school, I'll be a miserable wretch to my spouse, I'll on and on and on, right? Really? For that? And then it gets worse because of course when you pick up that food, the idea is that it'll scratch, the, the lie is that it'll scratch some kind of itch, right? But is that what happens? Does it scratch the itch or does it make it itchier? Do you not then create a brain that is demanding the treat again at the next available opportunity? When I left my 12-step program for food addiction, I did have a brain that kind of went, because I'd never done the research before, not really. I had a brain that went, do I really need to be that perfect with my bright lines now that I'm out of the universe in which you can't speak at a meeting and you can't sponsor anyone and you lose all your social clout and privileges? Uh, literally, you, you're gagged, like you can't speak at all for 90 days if you take a bite of food. Do I really need to be that strict now? I'm out of that universe. I'm in this bright line eating universe where we're not, you know, we don't penalize people that way. And suddenly, the voice of the saboteur woke up. It had been asleep for a long time. And now here I am four and a half years later, very grateful. I mean, I created Reboot Resume, worked with Everett on this bright line freedom. I, there are no words for the necessity. I had to do what I did over the last four and a half years, dipping deep in the food and then emerging again. I just kept mining lessons out of that depth. I was just like, oh, here's the, I mean, it was worth it. It was worth it. But for me personally, it was not worth it. For the Bright Line Eating movement, it was worth it. Glad I did the research. Happy to have shared the lessons. Not worth it. Because what happens is you train your brain either way. Either way, you've got, if you're squeaky clean bright, you train a brain that expects you to be squeaky clean bright. And what happens is eventually it stops asking for any exceptions. Literally, the inputs to the basal ganglia, which are the decider molecules, the, the parts of the brain that literally decide what you're gonna do moment to moment, they get fed options by uh, the cortex in general. They get fed options of like, well, we could go to a movie tonight. Well, we could read a book tonight. Well, we could, does it say we could fly to Mars tonight? Probably not. Why? Because that's not a realistic option given the lay of the land. The fly to Mars suggestion never comes in for what to do on a Friday night, right? Similarly, as soon as the brain knows that you're not going to eat anything off plan. It gives up making the suggestion. You train your brain to never propose that bite of that food. In contrast, if you have a stretch of bright days and then break, you train your brain to become a brain that has a stretch of days and then breaks. So that voice that says that it'll be easy to start again on January 1st, I'm sorry, but it's not accurate. That voice has no idea and it's not speaking from any place of knowledge or experience. And I'll just say, no one's exempt. Susan Pierce Thompson here with 16 years doing this and the PhD to boot was not able of her own accord to get out of that sand pit right? It's quicksand. Because I have a brain too that can get trained to break and resume or it can get trained to stay bright. And it doesn't matter what I know or what I believe. What matters is what I do. 
And if I pick up the extra food, I now have a brain that does that, irrespective of what I believe or know or want. So let's think about our holiday mindset going into the next couple months. What kind of lives do we want? One of my Gideon Games leaders shared a quote with me and I think she'd got it from somewhere else so I'm sorry I won't be able to attribute it to the right place but it was something like, let's not give up what we want most for what we think we want right now. Let's not give up what we want most for what we think we want right now. All of the stuff over here, happiness, health, well-being, self-confidence, joy, gratitude, self-worth, off those medications, living in a right-sized body, no heart disease, no diabetes, on and on and on. Or a couple bites of something that probably would taste yummy for a bit and then we'd feel pretty bad right afterwards. In what world are those even close to equivalent? So, I am super grateful, and I guess because I've had in my past as long as eight years of squeaky clean bright lines with no break um, consecutively, I guess I have a brain that gets back to it relatively quickly, like at 50 whatever days, I'm peaceful. I have a brain that's not suggesting any other bites of food. If you have never had that, I really encourage you to stick around here and do the work to get it. It's worth it. Whatever rebel part you have that's bucking and saying, they can't make me stop eating sugar and flour. <laughs> no, we can't but you could choose to, there's no gun to your head. And if you right now, actually for real have squeaky clean bright lines and a modicum of freedom, I invite you to join me this holiday season in discovering what real warmth real family connections and real holiday cheer are about and forego the lie that these two things are even close to equivalent. They're not. Let's stay bright together. Let me have done the research for you. The long downward trajectory is not worth it. That's the weekly vlog and I'll see you next week.